Okay, class, this will be part two of your neuro lecture. Um, on Tuesday of this week, we went over um, some assessment information as it relates to the neurological system. We also went over multiple sclerosis as well as myasthenia gravis. So please make sure that you review your information. Um, today we're going to begin with Parkinson's disease. So as you see here, Parkinson's disease is a progressive degenerative um, disability and the person suffers um, with tremors and rigidity. And what happens with Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is a depletion of dopamine. And so what is the purpose of dopamine? Dopamine is what the body needs um, to influence initiation, modulation, and completion of movements, among other things. It also helps to regulate um, autonomic movements. So when we say initiation, modu modulation, and completion, that's me reaching my hand, um, me deciding I want to open a door. I reach for the door, I touch the doorknob, and twist the doorknob and open it. So that's initiation, modulation, and completion. And so dopamine helps us um, with our smooth, coordinated movements. And so with Parkinson's disease, we see that dopamine is diminished. Um, one of um, it's the thalamus of the brain um, becomes overactive with Parkinson's as well, and it causes the person to have tremors. Um, when we look at dopamine and where it's manufactured, dopamine is produced in the substantia nigra of the brain, and it's um, with that it's transmitted to neural pathways via the basal ganglia. So dopamine is produced in the brain and is transmitted. Tr I'm sorry, transmitted to our neural pathways via the ba basal ganglia. So some of the features that we see um, with um, Parkinson's disease is that the person has tremors at rest. Um, you see rigidity, bradykinesia, um, deflex posture, loss of postural reflexes, freezing movements. Um, one of the um, main problems with Parkinson's disease, as I said, the person has a decrease in dopamine, but in Parkinson's disease, the person has an increase. Uh, increase in acetylcholine. So we just talk, learned about acetylcholine when we talked about myasthenia gravis. So here, um, it may not be that the person necessarily has too much acetylcholine. It's just that we have a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. And so when dopamine is depleted, all the person has is the acetylcholine. And so the person has these excitatory messages that are being transmitted to our muscles. And so that's why the person has the tremors and the rigidity and some of the other things that we will discuss with Parkinson's disease. And so, as it says here, the person, um, usually it's a gradual and insidious process, the, um, the course of Parkinson's disease. It usually starts with tremors. The person um, may have peel rolling movements of the fingers. They may have slight, a slight limp, um, decreased swinging of the arms. Um, and usually it progresses to a shuffling gait. Um, and the arms are usually flexed, and the person may have slow postural reflexes. Um, the person, um, as this condition continues, um, the person will have tremors that affect handwriting. Um, they may have tremors that become more prominent at rest, and usually the tremors become um, aggravated by stress and when the person is trying to concentrate. Um, <clears throat> With the rigidity, this is when the person has increased resistance to passive um, passive motions or passive range of motion. The person has a jerking quality when they're trying to move their joints, and this is what we call cog wheel. Um, along with this cog wheel, with the cog wheel movements, it causes the muscles to become sore, tired, achy feeling. Um, and the person usually experiences this in the um, head, in the upper body, spine, and the legs. 
Um, with bradykinesia, this is when the person has slowness of all voluntary movements and speech. Um, they have slow blinking. Um, they um, will have a stooped posture, mask, facial expression, and they develop a rigidity of their facial muscles. So um, not only is this person going to have a problem with ambulation, if they've got rigid facial muscles, we see that we're probably also going to have a, a patient that's going to have some problems with nutrition. Some other clinical manifestations that we see, um, you see the skin problems, heat intolerance. As I said, one of the first things I said is that dopamine was responsible, um, played a part in our autonomic movements and also with our autonomic nervous system. So um, the person may have some postural hypotension because what happens um, with Parkinson's is, Parkinson's is that some um, patients will lose sympathetic tone and so we know that once that sympathetic nervous system is activated it increases our blood pressure because we have vasoconstriction well if we lose sympathetic tone then the opposite happens we have vasodilation and that causes the blood pressure to drop so that's why we see postural hypotension and since we know those things we know how we should um, educate our patients they need to, you know, rise slowly from bed, um, let the feet dangle, change positions slowly. Um, again, with the autonomic nervous system slowing down, it also it's also going to affect the GI system. So the person may have problems with um, constipation, dementia, anxiety, and depression may all um, develop as a result of the person um, develop as a result of Parkinson's disease. So. The treatment um, for Parkinson's disease, all of these medications are discussed in your book um, with your mono, uh, monoamine oxidase type B inhibitors. Um, first of all, why do we want to inhibit monoamine oxidase? Monoamine oxidase um, produces free radicals that may be involved with neural degeneration. Again, um, monoamine oxidase um, is a substance in the body that produces free radicals that may be involved in neurodegeneration. And so what we have to remember is um, because of the damage substantia nigra, the patient has decreased dopamine. And so we want to um, give the person the MAO inhibitors because it's going to stop the damage of the substantia nigra. We need that because that's where our dopamine um, originates. Um, when we look at the dopamine agonists, you have your levodopa, your carb carbidopa, levodopa. Um, levodopa is converted to dopamine in the brain. Um, dopamine itself cannot um, be used because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, with cinnamet, cinnamet, as you see here, cinnamet is carbidopa, levodopa. Cinnamet inhibits the enzyme which breaks down levodopa so it can reach the brain and be converted to dopamine. So I like to use an example if you think cinnamet inhibits the enzyme that breaks down levodopa so that it can reach the brain where it's going to be converted into dopamine. And so some signs and symptoms that you may um, see when a person is um, on cinnamet, the person may have some nausea and vomiting, the urine and sweat may become dark, and the person may have um, dyskinesias, which would be the person, um, they would have um, an impairment and executing voluntary movements. They may have confusion and they may have an on-off reaction. And so what on means is that the person is free of symptoms and when the person is off, then the person would have full-blown symptoms. And so um, with the anticholinergic medications, these medications are given because they're going to um, treat the spastic disorders. So we're given anticholinergics because remember we said we had the imbalance where we had um, low dopamine levels and high acetylcholine levels. So we're going to give the anticholinergics to help treat the spastic disorders. And so um, once we give this, then the person is going to have less of those extra movements like the tremors. Um, in the book, um, I 
pointed out to you that there was a, um, a correction that needed to be made when it talked about Parlodale. It said that the medication was a, um, a dopamine antagonist, but actually it's a dopamine agonist. If we think about what an antagonist means, it's something that works against. So it wouldn't make sense that we would want to give a medication that's going to block dopamine. We're going to give medications that prompt dopamine. So we it's a dopamine agonist. And so um, we usually see or sometimes see Parlodale being given with Levodopa and it helps to increase the therapeutic effect of Levodopa. With this medication we have to monitor the person for you know your nausea and vomiting, orthostatic hypotension, um, But when we look at Parkinson's disease, long-term effects, there is no cure for Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Um, the cornerstone of therapy is the L-DOPA therapy um, because it's going to increase dopamine in the brain. So, um, as I said, um, corner, the cornerstone of therapy for Parkinson's is the L, um, treatment with L-DOPA. Um, because this is going to increase dopamine in the brain. And we already talked about some of the side effects, the nausea and vomiting, hypotension. The person could have some cardiac dysrhythmias. And also, even though they're giving the person therapy, they may still have some involuntary um, movements with, the, um, with this medication treatment. When we look at um, Cinemet, the levodopa carbidopa mix, carbidopa prevents the peripheral breakdown of levodopa so that more is available in the central nervous system. And so once it reaches the brain, then it converts to dopamine inside of the brain. Remember that um, pure dopamine can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And so, as I said, these two medications, the levodopa and the carbidopa, work together and that... Um, Carbidopa is going to block the breakdown so that levodopa can enter into the brain and convert to dopamine. And so again, some of the same side and symptoms with the um, blood pressure, nausea and vomiting, blurred vision. The person may have some depression, um, altered mental status. You want to make sure that you're monitoring the person um, for urinary retention. And we also want to make sure that we are monitoring the person's blood pressure um, for any unsafe drops in blood pressure. Um, possible surgeries for Parkinson's disease. As I said, this is a, um, is a chronic disorder, so all of the procedures that are discussed are primarily um, done to control symptoms and help to improve the person's quality of life. But um, as of today, um, to date, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease. With the pallidotomy, um, this is destruction of the involved brain tissue um, that's causing the tremors. The um, pallidum of the brain is responsible for involuntary movements such as tremors. And so by doing the pallidotomy, it's going to help to control um, the symptoms or to help control those tremors. Um, with the stereotactic um, thalamotomy, um, this destroys the affected area by causing a lesion in the thalamus where um, tremors could also come from. With the fetal um, tissue transplant, um, this um, is a procedure that's still in the test phases. Um, other books have said that um, clients have shown improvement in motor skills after receiving transplanted tissues, but the long-term results are still being, um, still being studied. And um, also, there's been um, procedures done such as um, electrode placement that acts like a pacemaker that's, um, that are used to help control those extra movements. As far as intervention, safety is going to be a big issue with our person with Parkinson's disease. Because of the increased muscular rigidity, the person is at risk for um, falls. And so um, we already talked about range of motion. The person has the rigidity, and so they are likely to resist those passive range of motions, but we still need to work with our patient um, with helping them to move or move those um, 
those joints through those range of motion exercises. PT is going to be individualized based on how progressed or how progressive the person's um, Parkinson's is. Um, we want to um, help the person to ambulate at least um, QID. Um, we want to encourage assistive devices if needed. Of course, we're always going to provide for safety, but we've got to make sure that we're creating a safe environment, making sure that there are um, no throw rugs or other hazards around the patient. The person may require bars in the bathroom, um, non-skid surfaces. Um, Things like um, putting Velcro straps on shoes and clothing are going to be easier for a patient to manipulate and help them to maintain some independence. Um, it's, go it's going to be more difficult for a patient that has tremors to manipulate buttoning a shirt or fastening um, pants and zipping those things up and tie tying their shoes. So. Um, Velcro straps um, on shoes and clothing may be more helpful for this patient. They may need an elevated toilet seat, um, higher backs on chairs and toilets so that the person has an easier time standing. With communication, you want to allow the patient time to speak. As we said before, the person develops rigidity of the facial muscles, so we want to allow them time to speak, encourage the patient to deep breathe before they speak. Um, um, speech therapy may be needed um, for speaking, but also because of the um, swallowing difficulties that can develop. If the patient cannot speak, we may want to use alternative methods of com communication, such as communication boards or computers. Um, as far as sleep, we want to, of course, have a, a quiet environment, a position of comfort. Um, of course, we already talked about the range of motion, but what's also going to be important for this person is to sleep on a firm mattress, a firm, good mattress, because any mattress that is not firm is going to um, cause the spine to be out of alignment, and it's going to um, impact the person's rigidity even more um, in their spine. So we want to make sure that the person has a good firm mattress so that we're preventing any extra flexion on the spine. With nutrition, this patient may need to be on calorie counts um, and be weighed on a weekly basis. Because of the um, tremors that the patient has, this is extra energy expenditure, calorie expenditure, so the person, um, they're burning more calories because of the tremors. And so what we want to do is um, encourage small, frequent meals for this patient. They may need soft um, meals, um, but it's based on the individual, how much swallowing difficulty the person has. Um, we can assist the patient, um, assist them by massaging facial and neck muscles before they eat, especially if they have rigidity. Um, suction at bedside just as a safety measure. Um, we want to make sure that we're giving the person adequate roughage and fiber because of the risk of constipation. We talked about increased fiber. Um, we want to increase the person's mobility, um, so we're going to help them to ambulate or make sure that we're turning them as needed to help stimulate peristalsis. The person, we know that um, stool softeners and suppositories would also help to facilitate bowel, regular bowel movements. With self-care, we want to encourage independence as much as possible, but set time limits. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping items within reach, and we want to give the person a time frame to allow the patients to do their own care because we do want to promote as much independence as possible. Um, Bell's palsy is the next disorder that we will talk about. Um, Bell's palsy is... Um, it's a disorder that affects the motor aspect of facial of the facial nerve nerve, which is um, the seventh cranial nerve. It is the most common type of peripheral facial paralysis. Um, it affects men and women in all age groups, usually between the ages of 20 to 40, and it results in a unilateral paralysis of the facial muscle. So remember the key here is that it's going to be unilateral. The thing about Bell's palsy though is that um, there is usually no evidence of a pathologic cause with Bell's palsy. 
Um, with the clinical manifestations, typical findings on the affected side include um, the person may have upward movement of the eyeball on closing the eye. They may have drooping of the mouth, um, flattening of the nasolabial fold, which is over the nose, um, slight lag in closing the eye, and the person may have difficulty eating. The person usually cannot um, close the eye on the affected side. They have problems with smelling, whistling, and taste may also be impaired with Bell's palsy. When a person has Bell, Bell's palsy, um, we want to do a, um, a complete history on this person because, of course, we want to rule out stroke. And so usually if we have a person that's experienced a stroke in addition to the face, whichever side of the face has been affected, we, all, we may also see um, extremities being affected on that same side as well. But with bells, we're only going to see the head being affected. So we want to do a thorough history. Um, we want to assess the person's level of consciousness, which, which should not be affected with Bell's palsy. We want to assess motor function of that side of the face. As I said, it's going to be affected with Bell's. Um, we want to also um, make sure that we're assessing pupillary function and eye movement. Um, with a stroke, the pupillary function and eye movement may be affected. With Bell's, we should still see normal pupillary reaction. We want to make sure that we're monitoring respiratory patterns and vital signs, which should all be within normal limits. And so with Bell's, there's no known cure. It's usually um, self-limited, though. It's, it's not a chronic. It's usually not a chronic disorder. Um, with palliative measures, we can give the person um, analgesics if the person um, has this that has it because it's occurred from herpatic lesions. Um, we could give corticosteroids because we know that they're going to help decrease inflammation. And if the person actually has an infl if it's an inflammation that's causing that cranial nerve 7 to be affected, then we can give corticosteroids to reduce that nerve tissue edema. Um, with physiotherapy, this is just, just includes moist heat, general massage, and stimulation of that facial nerve. And we also want to make sure that we're protecting that eye. The eye does not close, may not close completely. So we want to make sure that we're providing corneal protection um, by way of giving the person artificial tears, eyeglasses, eye patch if needed. With trigeminal neuralgia, this is another disorder that affects the face. With trigeminal neuralgia, we have the fifth cranial nerve being affected. With the trigeminal nerve, and there's a picture of it in your book, the trigeminal nerve has three divisions, um, and neuralgia may can occur in any of the areas that you see listed here. It can affect the ophthalmic region, it can affect the maxillary region, or the mandibular region. And the person with um, trigeminal neuralgia has sudden, intense, painful spasms. And so this is slightly different from the person with Bell's. The person with Bell's may have some discomfort, but the person with trigeminal neuralgia is going to have intense face facial spasms. Sometimes um, the person may have an infection um, that leads to these areas. Maybe the person had an abs uh, abscess tooth, maybe um, an infection somewhere, and it caused causes the person to develop irritation in this trigeminal nerve. And so with neuralgia means it's a sharp shocking pain that follows the path of a nerve and so it's usually due to irritation or damage to a nerve and so again if the person has some type of infection um, that originates around that trigeminal nerve it can cause the person to develop neuralgia which is again a sharp shocking pain. When we look at um, neuralgia the causes as it says here um, can be the causes can be intrinsic um, or extrinsic um, for example a person can have multiple a person with multiple sclerosis can develop trigeminal neuralgia and as it says here something extrinsic is something from the out from outside of the trigeminal root um, and can cause compression Things like tumors, vascular abnormalities such as, um, let's see, um, 
aneurysms, any type of any type of ballooning of a vessel, um, dental abscesses, jaw malformation, anything that causes compression on the trigeminal root can cause irritation of the trigeminal nerve. So with the clinical manifestations, um, the person is going to have intermittent episodes of intense pain of a sudden onset. The pain is usually not relieved by analgesics. Any type of stimulation, um, touch, facial hygiene, talking, anything, any movement of the face can trigger an attack. Um, it's usually more prevalent in the maxillary and the mandibular um, areas of the face, and usually it happens on the right side of the face. Um, bilateral trigeminal neuralgia is going to be rare. And so, as it says here, as I said before, it's normally unilateral. This person doesn't have any type of paralysis. All of the facial features are still going to be intact. It's just that the person is going to have intense pain. So that's one way to distinguish it from Bell's. There, there are no um, changes in the facial features. Um, trigeminal neuralgia can last, you know, from weeks to months. Um, the person may have... Um, um, bursts of pain, um, and then they'll have, you know, times when they're not going to experience any pain. Um, there um, is currently no diagnostic test per se to diagnose trigeminal neuralgia. We can do CT scans, MRIs, and angiography to see if there's a lesion compressing against the trigeminal nerve, however. Um, diagnosis is usually made um, based on the in-depth history with attention being paid to any triggering, triggering stimuli um, such as recent infections, dental work, any trauma. So um, usually the history is what helps the physician to come upon a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, again, careful history is obtained regarding the, tr the triggering stimuli because we want to avoid those things if possible. Dental hygiene and nutritional intake have to be evaluated when the person has this disorder because remember, any tactile stimuli to that side of the face causes the person to have intense pain, but they've got to eat and the person needs to brush their teeth. So we have to take into consideration, we have to do a focused pain assessment um, focus pain assessment and management for this patient. They're going to require some type of nutritional support um, depending on how severe the situation this person's condition is. Um, they're going to need nutritional support because um, once they attempt to chew, it's going to be extremely painful. The person may at this period of exacerbation want to use a toothpick instead of a water pick instead of a toothbrush with um, outcomes management, with the non-surgical approach um, that can be used, the book talks um, medications, um, dilantin and Tegretol, these are anticonvulsants, and they're usually used in the treatment of um, trigeminal neuralgia. They're usually used for seizures, but um, they can be used um, with trigeminal neuralgia to help control impulses. Um, the book also talks about um, microvascular decompression. If the person actually has a vessel um, compressing that nerve, then we're going to remove that vessel or um, remove that area of compression on that nerve. Also, the book talks about um, alcohol injections into the nerve that may relieve pain for up to 16 months. What um, you have to remember with some of the procedures that are discussed in the book, depending on the type of procedure, it may um, permanently disable the pain sensation on the affected, affected side, which is going to be good for the patient if they're having an exacerbation. But if the pain sensation is totally gone, if the person develops any type of infection on that side of the face, they may not notice it. So with this person, they want to make sure that they're getting regular eye exams, um, dental exams, having their ears checked on a regular basis just to make sure that they don't have any infections on that side that they may not have sensed. Um,
with our surgical management, um, same as any other facial, I mean, same as any other surgical procedure, um, the person may have some facial weakness and paresthesia, the tingling and the numbness on that side. So um, we usually want the person to, you know, not eat on the side that they've had that procedure, not until that side of the face wakes up a little bit. Um, the person wants to test food before placing it on the mouth and may, you know, test it up against the, you know, maybe test it with their finger, maybe to the lip a little bit, making sure that it's not too hot before placing it in the mouth. Um, attacks can be triggered by foods that are too hot or too cold. Um, we want to assess, um, advance the person's diet slowly. Um, make sure that they visit a dentist, as I mentioned before. And if the person has um, an impaired corneal reflex, of course, we want to do eye care on that side. The person may need eye drops. They may need an eye patch to wear at night. Um, but that is it on trigeminal neuralgia. And so we're going to move on into gillian barre Syndrome. Gillian Barre syndrome, as it says here, was once thought to be a single entity, entity characterized by inflammatory peripheral neuropathy. So we know what our peripheries are. It is now understood to be a combination of clinical features with varying forms of presentation and multiple pathologic processes and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that because of the need for ventilatory support um, Gillian Barre is one of the few peripheral neurologic diseases that necessitate a critical care environment the person has to um, have a critical care environment um, it is what we usually see with um, Gillian Barre syndrome and um, what this AIDP stands for is acute idiopathic polyneuritis. Um, we usually see um, it's an autoimmune response to a viral infection. Um, it's rapidly progressive. And what happens with Gillian Barre is that it affects the motor components of the peripheral nervous system. It is a big issue. And so, as we see here, the biggest issue with Gillian Barre is that the person will have to have ventilatory support with Gillian Barre. Um, with etiology, there are numerous triggering events, but usually, as I said, usually we see it being um, associated with a viral infection. Um, most people that are affected with Gillian Barre will report a recent infection or some type of recent vaccination. So, what we see with Gillian Gillian Barre is that it affects the motor and sensory pathways of the peripheral nervous system as well as the autonomic nervous system functions of the cranial nerves. And so um, it is believed to be um, an autoimmune response to antibodies formed in response to a recent physiologic event and so we usually see antibodies being produced when a person has an infection or a vaccination hence what we said before it's usually because of some type of infection or vaccination and so what we see is once on um, the temporary inflammatory reaction stops myelin producing cells begin the process of re-insulating demyelinated portions of the peripheral nervous system. And so what happens is that um, the myelin sheath or th is the protective covering of our nerves. And so the myelin sheath around the peripheral nerves is destroyed, which slows the conduction of impulses across the um, involved nerves. However, remyelization does occur once remyelization occurs, the person um, regains muscle strength, and 95% of the patients with um, Gillian Barre um, will have complete recovery. But it's during this period where the person has the demyelization to occur um, is where they have the problems.
because of the slowed um, impulses. So some the symptoms that we see include um, motor weakness. The person can have um, a, uh, ascending or descending weakness or paralysis. Um, the person may have paresthesias or and other sensory changes. Also, the person is going to have cranial nerve dysfunction. Remember, it affected all the cranial nerves, so anything within the head can be affected. So you see here oculomotor, fa oculomotor facial, um, vagal, spinal accessory, hypoglossal, all of, these, all of these nerves are going to be affected. And the person is going to have some autonomic dysfunction. You can have problems with the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. Um, problems with the BP, usually the person has problems with hypotension, they may have some cardiac dysrhythmias, um, the person may develop a paralytic ileus because the GI tract slows down and so they may develop an ileus and some urinary retention as well. When we're looking at assessment and diagnosis, um, there's an abrupt onset of lower extremity weakness that progresses to flaccidity and ascends over a period of hours to days. And so what that means is that it start, usually starts at the lower extremities and ascends up to the respiratory system. Um, the motor loss is usually symmetric, bilateral, and ascending, uh, ascending paralysis. Um, in the most severe cases, the person may have co complete flaccidity of all peripheral nerves, including the spinal and cranial nerves. The person with Guillain-Barre is going to require frequent assessment of the respiratory system because all of the muscles, as we said, it's a, a, usually an ascending paralysis, and we've already talked about the diaphragm, so we know that we have respiratory muscles, and respiratory is our biggest issue with Guillain-Barre syndrome because the respiratory muscles are too weak for the person to breathe on their own, and they usually require mechanical ventilation. Um, most, the most common cause of death from Guillain-Barre is the respiratory arrest. So as the disease progresses and the respiratory effort weakens, intubation and mechanical vi ventilation are going to be necessary. This is typically why um, it said in the beginning that the critical care environment is needed for the person with Guillain-Barre because it is progressive and, it, you, and it's going to impact the person's rest, um, ability to breathe on their own. The person is going to need continued frequent assessment of neurologic deterioration um, until the patient reaches the peak of the disease and plateau occurs. Remember, starts from the feet, moves to the head. So we've got everything from the feet to the head becoming affected. And so the person, if the brain becomes affected, we're talking about all the cranial nerves, then the person can have some neurologic decline. So we have to make sure that we're doing ongoing respiratory and neurologic assessments. <clears throat> there is usually no curative treatment available. We, uh, again, um, the person is going to require um, ongoing critical care ventilatory support. Um, this disease typically just has to run its course, which is usually characterized by ascending paralysis that advances over one to three weeks and then remains at a plateau for two to four weeks. The plateau stage is followed by a descending paralysis and return to normal or near normal function. So what that means, the person is paralyzed from the feet up, let's just say from the feet up to the shoulders. So with descending paralysis, the person regains movement in the shoulders back down to the feet. So ascending paralysis followed by descending paralysis. And so usually with the initial phase, it begins with the onset of symptoms and usually um, one to three weeks, um, the disease will um, cease to progress. With plateau, the person has no further changes. They neither deteriorate 
on they neither improve and this can last up to two weeks and so with recovery the person has a gradual improvement it may take um, as long as two years for the person to fully recover um, they may have residual numbness stiffness um, as a result of um, having this disorder the main focus is the support of bodily functions and prevention of complications. So we know here that we've got a person that's going to need our support with, um, they're going to need respiratory support, nutritional support, um, skin. We know that we have a person they can't move, so we've got to make sure that we're maintaining the person's skin integrity. We've got to make sure that we're um, paying attention to range of motion because we would hate for this person to develop contractures and um, stage 4 decubitus because they can't move. So we have to make sure that we're doing all of these things for our patient. And as it says here, the main focus is going to be bodily function and prevention of complications. We know that infection can be one of the reasons that the person develops Guillain-Barre. So we don't want them to develop any infections while they're with us. We want to make sure that we're, um, again, like I said, avoiding the hazards of mobility. The person is at risk for um, injury, imbalanced nutrition, um, with the plasma phoresis, it says here that it's often used in an attempt to limit the severity and the duration. Um, it's contraindicated if the person is hemodynamically unstable. We said that the person is going to have some problems with the autonomic nervous system, which means that they may have, they may already have low blood pressures anyway. So if the person is hemodynamically unstable, then this is a contraindicated procedure. The reason, though, that we would do this um, plasmapheresis, again, we want to remove those antibodies that may be triggering the autoimmune response. Um, IV immunoglobul immunoglobulin may be used. Steroids may be used because we know that they're going to help to reduce, um, reduce inflammation. We want to make sure that we're supporting all um, normal body functions until the patient can safely do so um, on his or her own. So they're going to require extensive long-term care. Recovery can be a long-term process. A long-term process. So again, we're making sure that we're paying attention to um, nutrition, skin, range of motion. Because um, usually with Gillian Barre, this is not um, this is not something that just affects older people, um, it affects um, people of all ages. And so we would hate, I would hate to think that someone in their 20s, um, even their 30s or 40s or 50s, um, that has a self-limiting disease would develop a stage 4 decubitus and contractures in a three-week period just because um, nurses aren't doing range of motion and um, skin care the way that they should. So we want to make sure that we're supporting the person's normal body functions because they cannot. Again, um, our nursing management is going to focus on surveillance of complication, making sure that we're um, monitoring the person for any signs of infection. We've got to monitor ABGs. The person, again, we said that the person is going to be mechanically ventilated, so we have a person that can possibly have some problem with acidosis, alkalosis. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring the person, um, monitoring ABGs. They may need physical therapy. Of course, we're going to need dietitian, um, a dietitian on board. Um, despite all of the motor and sensory problems that this person has, um, they may have um, they may have some changes in LOC. Um, they may have some I'm sorry some problems with the um, cranial nerves, but the person's level of consciousness and the intellectual function remain unchanged. So even though you have a person that cannot move, they may not be able to talk, they see and they hear everything that is being done around them. And so you have to make sure that you're paying attention and being real careful with your nursing care of your patients with Gillian Beret. 
it's anxiety producing and it's scary because again this person realizes everything that's going on and so they know that they can't move they're on a ventilator and they can't do anything for themselves so we have to make sure that we're providing ongoing comfort and emotional support for our patient once the person is intubated um, and on mechanical ventilation, we want to make sure that we're observing for pulmonary complications such as atelectasis. That this is when the um, airways totally collapse. Um, pneumonia, we know that this is when the person develops fluid in their lungs. Pneumothorax, that's when the person, um, one of the lungs collapses. And so we want to make sure that we're assessing the person's lung, assessing lung sounds frequently and routinely. We have to make sure that we're monitoring the person's O2 status frequently. We have to make sure that we're monitoring the blood pressure. We have here that it says autonomic dysfunction. Is, um, is, um, it usually happens with the person, and so the person can have variations in their heart rate and their blood pressure. So we want to, again, make sure that we're monitoring the respiratory rate, monitoring for any abnormal chest movements or abdominal movements that, can, that may indicate that the person's respiratory um, system has been further um, has been um, further has received is being compromised. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, with the um, hypertension, though, we want to monitor. The person can have either hypertension or hypotension. So, um, if the person has hypertension and tachycardia, then they may require a beta, a beta blocker for um, their hypertension. The immobility from Gillian Barre can last um, several months. Usual course of Gillian Barre, um, it says here the average um, of 10 days. Um, the person um, usually has 2 to 48 weeks of total physical recovery. Um, the patient requires physical and occupational rehabilitation because of the possible, because of the problems of long term immobility. And so PT is going to um, depend on the recovery of the person's respiratory function. If the respiratory system has not um, been compromised much, then the person may recover a little bit quicker than the person who had um, ventilatory issues. Um, once rehab is initiated, attention is devoted to maximizing the person's motor function through exercise and occupational therapy. Um, with nutritional support, we're going to um, usually it's accomplished through the use of enteral feedings. Um, remember that we said all the facial, all the cranial nerves are going to be affected, so that means that the hypoglossal, the facial, the glossopharyngeal, all the cranial nerves have been affected, so the person is going to have impaired eating. Um, the person may be um, at risk for aspiration. Um, so at this point, when the person, you know, um, has the total paralysis, of course, we're going to utilize the feeding tube and TPN. Um, and when the person starts to develop the descending paralysis, again, the person has to fully recover, and so the muscles have to regain their strength again. And so during that time, we want to make sure that um, the person is, you know, um, that the head of the bed is elevated, um, that we have sex suction at bedside if needed. With Gillian Barre, the person um, may need pain control. Um, with this um, disorder, we said that it, it's a peripheral neuropathy, so the person usually has a neuropathic pain. So we want to give them um, medications for that. The person may need, well, will need extensive psychological support because, as I said, it does not affect the person's level of consciousness. And so um, communication, even though it's impaired, we need to find alternative forms of communicating with the patient, such as an eye-blink system, I blink um, system, message boards, asking the person yes, no questions, blink um, once for no, blink twice for yes, so that we're still um, maintaining a method of communicating with the patient and making sure that we're meeting their needs. Okay, so with um, 
Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a progressive degenerative neurologic disorder that's characterized by um, weakness, wasting of the muscles without any accompanying sensory or cognitive changes, much like with um, Guillain-Barre. The difference is, is that um, Guillain-Barre is self-limited and the person usually we ha will have, you know, regain, uh, regain normal function. The person with Lou Gehrig's disease does not regain normal function. Um, it's a rapidly progressive disorder. Um, it's usually um, associated with a viral cause and usually death ensues approximately three years after the onset of symptoms. When we look at the clinical manifestations of um, Lou Gehrig's disease, the person is going to have muscle um, weakness and fatigue. Um, they may have heaviness of the legs, uncoordinated movements, loss of motor control in the hands. This kind of looks like some of the same things that we saw with maybe um, our multiple sclerosis or myasthenia gravis. When we talked about the assessment of the neurologic system, we talked about the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. Um, and this is what's um, affected with Lou Gehrig's disease. Both the upper motor neurons are affected and the lower motor neurons. The person has a degeneration of the um, of the the book says the anterior horn cells. Um, with this degeneration, however, they don't regenerate. And so when we have a person that's got problems with the upper motor neurons, we see the spasticity, hyperreflexia. With lower motor neurons, you may see some flaccidity, weakness, atrophy, cramps, muscle twitching. And so the person has a conglomerate of all these things going on. Um, but there's no um, involvement of the central nervous system. So the person will still have sensory perception, much like we saw with multiple sclerosis. Um, Respiratory-wise, we see dyspnea. The person is going to have difficulty clearing the airway. And so um, they're going to have some weakened respiratory muscles. And they're also going to have weakness of the oral pharyngeal muscles, which is going to affect the person's ability to eat. It's going to cause some difficulty chewing and dysphagia. Emotional, the person is going to have a loss of control, um, will sense a loss of control. Um, it's stress-inducing. Um, inducing. Um, the person intellect, again, is not, in, um, is not affected, much like Gillian Barre. Um, the person remains alert and mentally intact throughout the course of, dis of, of the disease. Death usually um, happens as a result of pneumonia with this disorder. Um, Electromyography provides supporting evidence um, of the impaired impulse conduction to the muscle. So this is one of the ways that we differentiate multiple sclerosis, um, differentiate this disease from multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis. The um, electromyography is going to support that um, the person is not receiving the impulses to the muscles, which is what we see with Lou Gehrig's disease, um, because those muscle nerve cells did not regenerate. And so our treatment here is supportive. It's palliative treatment, but not curative. Um, Relutic is a drug that is given to help extend a person's life, but it only helps for a few months. Um, it's believed that this medication can reduce um, reduce damage to the motor neurons and prolong survival for several months. Um, and it's mainly given to those patients that are having difficulty swallowing. Um, respiratory compromise usually results within two to five years of diagnosis. And so many of these patients are going to require um, mechanical um, support. They're also um, going to receive medications to treat pain, depression, sleep disturbances, and constipation. Our interventions for this patient are going to be um, 
based on you are going to focus on you know nutrition breathing mobility um, communication we're going to assist the person with range of motion stretching exercises um, eventually the person will not be able to stand or walk or get out of bed on their own so we want to encourage mobility um, as much as we can 10% um, of Patients with Lou Gehrig's disease um, survive for 10 or more years. Only less than 10% of them will. With nutrition, um, we want to have suction at bedside. Um, the muscles are going to continue to gradually weaken. And so um, the person is going to have weakened swallowing, weakened swallow, weak swallowing muscles. I'm sorry. So small frequent meals are going to be better, um, softer meals. Eventually the person may need enteral feedings or tube feedings. With breathing, mechanical ventilation um, is usually going to be necessary for this person. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping the head of the bed elevated. We want to turn, um, encourage the person to turn and cough every two hours or we're going to have to assist them in that. Oxygen is going to be necessary. Um, and we're going to suction the person as needed. As far as communication, um, again, much like the person with um, Gillian Beret, we may want to institute a yes-no system, um, a eye blink system, the use of word charts, um, and pictures. The person still has, again, still has the ability to see, smell, taste, hear, and recognize. And they also have, um, they also have the ability to sense touch. They don't, um, they can still, you know, sense and feel pain. And that ends part two of our neuro lecture.